I'm Chip Bach, and welcome to Blue Rock. On each episode, we'll discuss what life is like on this big blue rock, where we are all headed, separately and together, what changes we need to make to ourselves, the planet, and towards each other, and just discuss what daily life is like for your fellow crew. And maybe, just maybe, we may also see a commonality that connects all of us. Apologize in this episode with author and entrepreneur Todd Zog. Due to difficulties beyond our control, the first two minutes of Todd's side of the conversation was not recorded. All right, welcome to another episode of Blue Rock. Today we've got a great guest on, an uh, old friend of mine I've known for many years. His name is Todd Zog. Uh, Todd, in addition to holding many strategic leadership positions uh, in Fortune 500 companies and early stage companies, he's also been published in Forbes magazine for his insights on sales leadership and negotiations. He's also the author of a best-selling book, and we're going to talk about that quite a bit today, called The Warrior Sales Monk, available on Amazon and other booksellers. Uh, it's based on the research of over 11,000 sales representatives and 1, 000, over 1,000 performers in, corporate, in the corporate business world, so think Fortune 500. Since 2001, Todd has also been the founder and principal of Matrix Achievement Group, uh, which is a boutique global sales force uh, development firm that provides consulting, training, coaching, and technology solutions based upon the latest research on neuroscience of human behavior, uh, change, and decision-making. I've actually taken four to five Matrix courses throughout my career. That's how I originally met Todd. Uh, Matrix has tra trained over 50,000 sales professionals and leaders and worked with some of the biggest brands on the planet uh, with over 10,000 rave reviews, by the way, um, from top leaders around the world. As a serial entrepreneur, he's held leadership positions in four early stage companies, one of which sold for over $30 million within the first nine months of operation. Todd has spent the last seven years collecting information on human performance from PhDs, academic institutions, public health, and the U.S. military. So he kind of knows what he's talking about a little bit. Anyway, Todd, welcome to Blue Rock. Good to see you. Haven't, haven't, haven't been in physical proximity with you in a while, but uh, with you in spirit. And we'll talk about that too. <laughs> How's everything going? So, I mean, Todd, one of the reasons, you know, again, for those of you watching, obviously it's a podcast, but we, we simulcast or simul record and put this up on YouTube as well. If you can see this as Warrior Sales Monk, so you know what the book looks like, know what you're looking for when you're on Amazon. Like I said, I, I, this book is not new been around for a long time. Uh, I've read it several times. I've given it as gifts. Uh, one of the things that I love about it, and then we'll talk about this today, is that even though, you know, there's the internet and, and podcasts, et cetera, there's so many sales experts, people talking about, you know, corporate coaching and, and uh, imp personal improvement and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, this book might be great for a CEO, a salesperson, et cetera. But the beauty of it, and it's right there in the title, Warrior Sales Monk, I want you to focus on, focus on the monk part, uh, is really applicable to your personal life. Um, so if you're looking for ways as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, as a sales professional, et cetera, uh, to enhance your performance, it's in here. But if you're looking to enhance your, your relationships with your kids, uh, your wife, your neighbors, uh, it's a great book for that too. Just remove wherever it says customer or salesperson and insert the person you're trying to improve your relationship with. Trust me, it's all in there. And that's kind of the beauty uh, of the book. So we'll, we're going to talk more about that. So Todd, you know, obviously I know in the beginning of your book, and you talk about this in a lot of your stuff, warrior or monk. So tell me a little bit more about that. Tell me which one you are and, and we'll, we'll start off there. And so they, they experienced, you know, being alone with these top performers. And then when they did some customer facing with them, they said, these top performers are like this, you know, empathetic servant. I'm like, yeah. So they're competitive and an empathetic servant. And they're like, wait a minute. You, you think that's acceptable behavior? I think I, and I said, I think that's, you've just defined, you know, the core uh, DNA elements is, you know, they're competitive and then they have this empathetic spirit to them and they're well, an empathetic servant. 
Um, and so the behavioral guy sat back and he goes, well, if that's the truth, then maybe the title of your book should be Lions and Lambs. And I said, you know what, the, that has way too many religious connotations for all seven tribes of Israel. So let's, let's, so how we got to warrior <laughs> monk was the thinking of, you know, the warrior has courage. The warrior has emotional resilience, right, Chip? You've been in sales. You know, you get knocked oh, yeah. down, you get knocked down, and you got to get back up. We all know it's not about if you're going to get knocked down. You are going to get knocked down. The question is, are you going to get back up? Right. That's the warrior, right? And are you going to compete? But, you know, more importantly, even with the years of experience you've had and top performers, you know, the year after you hit a number, then you got to compete against yourself. Nobody talks to you about yeah. that when you first get in sales, right? You know, you're in your own territory and you win and you high five yourself. Other people high five you and then you wake up the next day and you go, wait a minute, I got to beat my number? Yeah, you got to beat your number, right. you know, so, you know, the warrior is thinking about how do I get better every day? The warrior looks in the mirror and says, I need to be competitive. I cannot be the same person I was yesterday. If I'm the same person I was yesterday, I'm, I'm losing the minute I get right. out of bed. Right. So that's the warrior mindset. And then the, um, the, uh, monk mindset is the empathetic servant. And that's the thinking of, you know, reflection, self-awareness is the most difficult thing for humans to do. We've heard it through thousands, thousands of years of gurus and masters have said to us, you know, self-awareness, you know, the Oracle Delphi said self-awareness on the top of her temple of all the of 148 maxims. She chose one of them and put it on the top of her temple and it said, know thyself. And the other uh, thing to consider St. Francis of Assisi said, know thyself in his writings. Years later, Stephen Covey said, right. know thyself. So if you're really paying attention, when we talk about being an empathetic servant in knowing thyself, you have to start with yourself and have awareness. But really what I just told you, when you consider Covey and St. Francis of Assisi, what I just told you is the Catholics and the Mormons agree on something and the end of the world really is here, Chip. Right, right. That's no, what true, I just told true. You. Right. I mean, the, yeah. I mean, look, that's the whole point of this of this podcast. Right. Is that, you know, this is one big blue rock. Right. Uh, we're all one human race of people. Um, and one of the things I think we've lost sight of <laughs> is that we're literally all one physical set of human beings. Um, you know, if you've listened to 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 um, William Shatner in his trip up into space and what he saw when he got up there. Uh, was he realized, oh my God, look how thin the, the, the veil is around the planet. And then looking out, you know, with, with not having any of the obstruction, looking out into space and realizing, wow, this is all we got. Like, this is it, right? Yeah. And if you could take all the leaders, especially with what's going on right now, you know, timely with what's happening in Europe with the Ukraine and, and Russia, if you could take those, the leaders and just put them up in space and go, guys, this doesn't matter. All this stuff that you're so focused on and been so focused on for so long no longer matters. Sure, it might have made a difference centuries ago and when nobody had any idea that there was another group of people on the other side of that large body of water they were staring at. But to be in the place we're at today and still be acting and thinking in this very, what I call a, th a low frequency 3D vibration on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. which by the way, even in sales, Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm having these same conversations, maybe not as esoteric, but I'm having these same conversations right now with some of our biggest customers. They're having trouble, you know, getting products. They're having trouble, you know, just with their own business models. Yeah. And one of my big things is, hey, we're in this together. This whole adversarial approach, like, you know, again, from a sales background with as, as many years as you and I've been in it, you know, the original way of selling was, you know, this this competition philosophy, which I want to talk about in a minute, too. But um, just that, that, you know, it's us against them and, you know, sitting on opposite sides of the table and I'm going to negotiate you and you're going to negotiate me and it doesn't matter anymore. We're in this together. Uh, and so I, I've kind of changed my whole, it's weird. I kind of feel like I've gone Todd, cause you met me long time ago when I was probably yeah. wearing a little bit more warrior armor than I am today. Uh, I'm way monk now, man. I am yeah. way, I'm all about letting the water flow past. You yeah. know, I'm very, they, they kind of joke with me all the time. They, they wonder if they're, when I do a Zoom call, if, if people are going to see me sitting in a, in a lotus position, you know, uh, with a robe on, kind of like, kind of like Buddha as, as I'm talking, because that's literally how I approach business, yeah. day to day life, my family. Um, 
you know, kind of everything. And, and to your well, that's, point, that's I, getting I feel you. like it's, it's, it's transitioning, right? We've, we've kind of, you yeah. and I've been here during a period of time on the planet where I think there's a lot of change, more change happening than maybe previous generations. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Well, there's a lot in there. I think I wanted, you know, to frame it first and foremost, we were, we had a conversation about, you know, the monk, the monk represents being an empathetic servant. And, you know, the first step in being an empathetic servant that I was getting to is humans need more awareness. Now you're there with that saying, Todd, I've gone through this awareness of I was more of a warrior and today, you know, I'm more of a monk. And, you know, I want to follow up to let you know that Harvard did some research with Martin Seligman. And when they looked at top performers, they came back and said top performers had two DNA qualities. I found this after our book. And the two qualities were ego drive and empathy. Now, ego drive is your desire to push into the fabric of life, right? right. Empathy is, you know, the, the, um, the monk piece of it, okay? Now, when you think about ego drive, what has shifted for you and probably, for, I know for me and what I'm hearing you say is ego drive, the validation is, was, you know, I'm going to push out and I'm going to be successful. I'm going to validate my existence by pushing in and pushing against, because it's like lifting weights. I'm only going to get better if I'm exercising muscles, pushing against things. Now, when you get older, you have this recognition of sometimes a mountain, sometimes a valley. And really, is it about pushing or is it about working together? Um, you know, and so I think to me, you know, what was so cool about your comment was your own self-awareness about your journey on that warrior monk thing. And there are times where the monk absolutely needs to be you know, far more powerful than the uh, warrior component in order for all of us to be more effective in connecting with other human beings. So those are the, the thoughts on... Exactly. And, and it's funny you brought that up because I noticed that in your book. Now, I've read it a couple of times. And obviously, before doing the podcast today, I went back and kind of took notes and, and read some through some of your things. And that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you because, you know, I've read this before. I've been through your trainings and stuff like that. And you had something in there called the real competition, right? Which was a section of the book where you talked about uh, the first one is you, right? You're the first competition in, in, in your life, so to speak. And we're just going to talk about it from a corporate sales standpoint. But again, remember, keep in mind, every time I'm saying corporate or sales for everybody listening, you can plug in just husband, father, brother, neighbor, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, whatever position you want to you want to pull out from your your personal life. But the first competition yep. is you. The second uh, is what um, change. Right. People yeah. are the, 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 the competition is change. The third is the products or services, meaning that are being utilized, uh, the budget. So money that might be being spent on other things that a customer that could be going towards your thing that you're trying to sell or, or yep. you're trying to get across. And then the final thing is what you think is your competition, which is your actual yep. competition. So if you're an Internet provider, the other Internet company or whatever it is right. that you're selling. <clears throat> but what I've found is I feel like competition we're evolving away from it, or let me back up. We're finally getting back to what we should have been doing. Uh, Darwin, I noticed, I've read a lot about him. When he came out with the whole, you know, and, and again, it wasn't him that, that came up with the survival of the fittest, but they kind of bookend them together when you talk about Darwinism, uh, is, you know, this whole survival of the fittest, you know, the lion's gonna go out and, you know, be the king of the jungle and all this stuff. That doesn't actually happen in nature, and they've realized that. Even Darwin himself said when it came to evolution, he was like, this is just a theory. I fully intend for it to be disproven before I pass away. And they leave that part of the book out, right? All of the schools were teaching yeah. it like crazy, which again, nothing wrong with it. It's not that evolution isn't real. Yeah. I just think when we start applying it to human, the human race uh, yeah. you know, on the planet, I don't know that it actually works, and especially the survival of the fittest thing. When you compare it to nature, which is what everybody's drawing it from, uh, lions aren't going yeah. out and killing every single lion on the Serengeti. Um, it, it doesn't doesn't work that way, right? There's a balance in right. nature. Sure, you will see predators yes. and prey and things like that, but they're not overusing their positions. You don't see predators going out and dominating an entire uh, area. They take what they need and they give to yeah. others, and they you know they they understand that balance. And I think we've lost sight of that as a human race. But I do feel like even though it's coming back, uh, Michukaku, the, 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 the world-famous physicist and thought scientist, 
you know, he talks about the fact that, you know, we're moving from a phase zero to a phase one planet. And going from a zero to a phase one planet means there's no longer any countries, borders, races, creeds, uh, uh, religions, etc. We're just one planet of people. Um, but he was quick to say that what, how you know you're moving into that is when there's so much strife. So meaning what we're seeing in our country, what we're seeing in other countries, what we're seeing country to country, all of that kind of, you know, I don't want the world to change. That pressure yeah. is actually the sign that we, I think we are changing, which is why I think your book, even though it was written a while ago, man, dude, it is. I was going through it again last night and just going, wow, this is so timely. There's so much in it. I, I just, I'm going to re give it to my team members. As a matter of fact, I'm going to re-gift it to them. So anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I think that was eloquently put. And when you think about what's going on with Ukraine and you think about the pressure that China's putting on Taiwan, th it is absolutely correct that they're working off of a paradigm of phase zero. And, you know, as a leader, they're trying to think through, you know, the survival of their people. And, you know, even the whole Ukraine issue is, I will tell you, for the most part, People don't understand the depth of that. I mean, it's horrible what's going on, women and children and all that, right? Um, it's just horrible. It's gut-wrenching. makes me want to throw up when I see it. You know, Putin's responding to the fact that Ukraine is a threat because the Western countries have been putting a lot of surveillance, surveillance equipment in there. We've been doing a lot of things to protect ourselves that's threatening to him but threatening off of an old paradigm. If our, you know, the economics of the world get so integrated that at some point you're just kind of like, you know, I've done, you know, I was, I was in Moscow. I've been in Moscow. And, you know, the economics of the world are fully integrated. In a, and so you would, but it, people that hang on to a phase zero that create strife like what we're seeing in Ukraine and we're going to see in Taiwan and we're going to see in some other areas of the world, um, they're hanging on to an old paradigm because they're fearful that, because what is the greatest thing we fear? Change. So we'll come back to change. You said the four levels of competition. First level of competition to yourself, and I mean it. You know, we spend all this money going out to, um, to outer space. We're gonna, and everybody goes, what are we doing there? Let's go under the ocean. We spend all this money going into the ocean. The real problem is that we haven't spent enough time understanding this. We have not spent enough time understanding this and why, and you listen to double PhDs that say the end of the world, the book of um, end of faith, um, the end of the world is going to be because of religion. And that takes you, you know, a wind out of you. You're like, wait a right. minute, you mean the end of the world is going to be caused by our religious strife? So that's crazy, right? So it takes us a moment where we got to sit back and take a look at all that and say, um, wait a minute, we're, if we're going from phase zero to phase one, I would tell you the other piece of that is also religion, is, is there's a lot of conflict going on about religion and some of the, um, the books I've read about why that conflict is heightened right now, right? It's as simple as, you know, if, if I've been, it's as simple as if I've been praying to my God or my gods, then why don't I have more blessings? Um, but when I look at that country, they seem to have a lot of blessings. That makes me feel inferior. How can my God be inferior? My job must be to, you know, lash out. And it's a form of jealousy. So, you right. know, when you really look at it, you know, phase Which zero is to ego, phase one, right? The, the, it's the ego. Jealousy and all, it's ego. It's leading with ego. It's fear of and change. And we haven't learned right. that that doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't get us anywhere. And it's a fear of change. And it's very reptilian. So when you talk about um, the conversation you were having about the frequency you want to be at, you know, you're starting to get into uh, how the human body is built, actually, which is fascinating, me, Chip, because you and I have never really talked about, you know, that radio frequency concept. Oh, yeah. But the reality is the way our body is built with the four brains, science has finally caught up to what a lot of us have known through the years. And that is that, you know, people are emotional beings, and that's happening at the reptilian brainstem level, protect, protect, hoard, here's my resources, I don't want to give anything up right. to anybody. And then there's the emotional right. brain, the limbic system, right, that responds to what has happened to me in the past, and I carry my little red wagon, and I'm going to react based upon what's happening in my past. Quality of life does not exist there. Quality of life right. is the radio frequency that's up on the frontal lobe. And so what's happening, what you see with the strife is everybody's, you know, reverting back to the reptilian brain mode, a lower right. frequency, rather than taking a moment and saying, 
you know, let me work on, forget outer space like the Matthew McConaughey ads, whether you liked it or not at the Super Bowl, right? Why are we looking on outer space? I would say, why are we looking at the ocean? Let's take a moment and come back to the, to the, to the brain and how the, the brain works and how we think and discover more about and have greater self-awareness about this issue of moving from phase zero to phase one and why we feel the strife, it's change. Change is uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we got to figure out how we can all help each other get to change. And I tell salespeople right. all the time, if you think you're selling a product, you're lost. You're selling right. change. Humans don't like change. So you, there's only two ways to overcome change. And then we're going to, I always know you've got some great feedback on this, but I tell salespeople, and the same holds true in our personal relationships, there's two ways to overcome change, okay? A human has to be in so much pain in the reptilian brain that they want relief. That's why interrogators right. put people in so much pain that they want relief. The other right. way is what I call camo chicken, camouflage. Don't look like change. I call it camo right. chicken because... Why when somebody in Louisiana says you want to taste gator and you go, I don't know, and they go, taste just like chicken. There's only two ways right. we can deal with change as human beings. I need to be in so much pain I'm going to change, or it needs to be camouflaged to me. You need to tell my right. emotional brain that, it's, that it looks just like something else. So when we talk about all the change that's going on on the planet, it, sometimes that pain is what it's required for everybody to understand, hey, if you do this, it's even going to be more painful, rather than... What I wish would happen is we say change is just like, you know, World War I was painful, World War II is painful, World War III, it's already happening and it's in our head. There is more challenges right. going on. World War III is here. It's not physical, it's emotional. And we have to overcome that and we have to win by breaking out of this reptilian brain mode and get into a different radio frequency that you're talking about, Chip. Correct, correct. Yeah, people don't realize, <clears throat> and they're measuring this now. I mean, this is not... You know, it used to be probably when I was a kid, when we were kids, Todd, it was probably more, you know, this was considered woo woo hippie talk, you know, like uh, this is weird stuff. But what's happened, like you said, Harvard and Yale and all these top thought centers uh, have done the science, right? Um, string theory, quantum physics, all the advancements in that uh, are really weird stuff. You go all the way back to when Einstein uh, when they were building the first atom bomb and those groups of scientists and they would run a, a set of experiments, there'd be maybe 12 or 13 of them, they'd leave. Another group would come in the next day and this is getting kind of getting into, I know you, you know, it's funny is there's some stuff in here where you didn't say Schrodinger's cat, but I was like, that's Schrodinger's cat he's talking about. It was. Hell? Why is this in a sales book? Yeah. <laughs> right? You didn't say it, yes. but I knew that's where it was coming from, right? So yes. for those of you who don't understand Schrodinger's cat, it's basically based on the fact that what reality is is based on who or what or when they're observing it, right? Uh, so what Einstein, they saw this to be a fact, and, and he recorded all this. Now we're going back, what, 1930s? Um, they'd come in, do an experiment. Uh, they would record all their, all their stuff. The next day, uh, a different group would come in, same parameters for the experiment, completely different result. And then they'd flip it back and then they'd get another one, another one. And this is when he first started to coin some of the original base theories of quantum physics is that, wait a minute, there's something weird going on here. If the physical reality says, if I do A, B, C, D in that exact order and quantity, et cetera, I should get the exact same result every single time, but it's changing. And the only variable was the person observing it. There's something weird going on there. Right. And then yeah. he started... We, you know, I even have, and Todd, we, you and I haven't even talked about this, but you know, I'm, I'm, we actually, my family, we're using Rife machines, which are recreations of the original algorithm from Dr. Royal Rife's uh, original machines from the 1920s and 30s, which again is all based off of some of Einstein's original work, which just has to do with that spooky at a distance um, stuff. And we'll talk about that a little bit, because I think some of that is coming into play, not only globally, uh, but I've actually witnessed it and seen it done in my business. Uh, so much so I've had some of my younger team members that, that I'm mentoring and stuff. They're like, dude, you're like Obi-Wan when you're talking to, how did you know they were going to say that? And I'd love to say, yeah, it's just cause you know, people are the same and you know, I have a lot of experience and I just kind of know, but it honestly, it goes a little bit further than that, right? Like you, I've kind of become a student of human nature, um, and started to realize that certain things are manip can be, 
uh, manipulating sounds controlling. That's not a really good word. Uh, manifest is probably a better word um, that you can manifest things uh, just on how you're approaching, you know, interactions and situations, whether it be personally or with other people. So um, one of the things I wanted to uh, touch on is when you were just talking about all this <clears throat> in the, one of the earlier parts of your book, you talk about how people worry about what other people think of them, which then pulls into that ego. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Why that's such a big and what you may be seeing, how that relates to now and also business, et cetera? Yeah, again, you know, um, people worry about what other people think about them. This is um, very much a reptilian brain issue. So MIT did some work on, you know, humans and the reptilian brain. And we had always, you know, known that the reptilian brain was evolved about our physical survival. Think a caveman, you know, out there and see movement in the tall grass, you know, kill or be killed, right? MIT's right. research came back and said, okay, wait a minute. You know, in the modern day, the reptilian brain is also involved in um, helping protect us emotionally, not just physically, okay? So when we start having this conversation about, um, you know, what people fear, their, their fear they're going to be judged, you know, it kind of points in the direction of, for example, um, the research shows that 93% of Americans hate um, fear public speaking more than death. Now, I want you to think about that. That is not rational. There's nothing rational about that. They Correct. fear public speaking more than death. I've helped a couple executives. Um, it's not our core business, but, you know, somebody said, hey, we, we got an executive that's got to give a talk at a national sales meeting, and they're very concerned. Um, you know, they're nervous about giving that presentation. And I dug in a little bit more, and I met with the individual. Just phenomenal. What a phenomenal individual. And so we talked a little bit about... Um, you know, the presentation, I said, would you do me a favor? And he said, yeah, would you, let's go and, you know, let's stand up and start to give me the talk. And the guy stood up and, and it was brilliant and it was good and the whole bit. And I stopped him halfway through it. And I said, you know, I said, I, I guess I didn't understand what a narcissist you are. <laughs> and he looked at me so like, shocked. What the hell did you just say? Yeah. What did you just say? And he yeah. cocked his head and looked at me and like, I, I, I think I'm going to, tell everybody that you're a jerk and never to work with you. And I said, right, right. Now that I have your attention, I need to tell you why it looks like you're being a narcissist. I said, yeah, I came into this room hearing that you were nervous about talking in front of a group of people. I'm hearing one of the most powerful, beautiful messages I've ever heard a leader de deliver. So you're so, so right now you're a narcissist because the only thing that's impeding you is your fear of being judged in a large room. And he stopped and looked at me and I said, Instead of your taking on the attitude of, of being a servant and delivering the message, I said, do you believe your message is authentic? He said, yes. Do you believe that you're, everybody needs to hear the challenges? Yes. Do you believe that the vision you guys have picked to move the company forward is, is important? He said, yes. He was very passionate. And I said, so the only thing left is you're a narcissist. <laughs> that was, it was like, dude, it was, I said, you just, before you get on stage, you have to go in that moment of being a servant. So what yeah. you and I are talking yeah. about is, you know, people that, you know, get locked up in uh, the reptilian brain, it does impede their ability uh, to grow. But as I've, a human now, being. so I've got a question about this, and I've asked this of other people too, and I've done some of my own research. Where does that come okay. from? Babies are not born being worried about Correct. crying next to the other baby in, in, you know, in the bassinet next to them in the hospital. So Correct. where does this come from? Where, you know, yep. so, it so to, it, it's either. Now, again, I, I've talked to some other people that tell me it, there is now evidence to show that it's being passed in utero and generation to generation. I can talk about that later. But if you just eliminate that and just say, okay, a baby's born, doesn't have this programming. Um, this programming is now, to me, become wildly obvious. I do feel like sometimes there's certain days when I feel like I've, I really am in the movie The Matrix and I'm seeing all the the zeros and yeah. ones coming down, so to speak, right. um, because it's the programming's getting really obvious. Like, and maybe it's just for me, it's becoming obvious, but it, it, it it's not new. It's the same one my parents went through, my grand, grandparents, great grandparents, and so on. I just am all of a sudden seeing it. I didn't see it when I was younger. Boy, I really see it now. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, is that, cause that, is that where that's coming from? Cause here you are, you're coaching people, human performance, you know, across the gamut 
from a corporate standpoint, but you're giving me an example of somebody who, like you said, it's the narcissism, which is not actually him, but it's creating this response, right? Which is why he brought you in uh, to work on this. Um, but where is that coming from? Because why are we so worried about what other people think? Um, anyway, go ahead. Oh, I think, I, I, so a couple quick answers. First of all, um, yeah, we tell people all the time, you know, the research shows you're only born with two fears. Baby only have two fears. Loud noises and spatial. Thank goodness, right? Right. Uh, after that, every other fear you have in your life has been, has been made up. Now, research is showing that maybe some of it is coming through, um, you know, in vitro, you know, as you're, you know, right. being f- right. formed as a baby. But I will, you know, really at the end of the day, I tell people the majority of our collection of our behaviors come from, um, there's like a filing cabinet on your reptilian brain that's designed to help keep all of us alive physically. And now we know emotionally in that filing cabinet, right, are the five senses and you've got you know, audio, visual, smell, te- uh, smell, taste, touch, okay? And from the moment you were a child, as you were experiencing things in life, you were pulling together pieces of data that you put into your filing cabinet, which then right. the reptilian brain sits back, and when it assesses something, what's happening is unconsciously, it's assessing something and opening up your filing cabinet and saying, let's say you meet somebody new, Chip, okay? Right. And it goes into your filing cabinet. Well, let's stop for a moment. Um, have you ever met anybody and not liked them, even as highly evolved as, as yeah. you and I would like to think? Yeah. yeah. And, and I feel horrible. It's then I feel guilty for like a day. Right. I'm like, I, I don't understand what's going on. Well, research shows it goes into the filing cabinet. You're asking, why do people behave the way they do? That's really what you're asking. It, it goes into a filing cabinet and it pulls out a file and says, when you were in second grade, there was somebody that looked like this person, that smelled like this person, that did something yeah. bad to you. Now, I'm one of those kids I was yeah. beat up at recess all the time. So, you know, I have a big filing cabinet of danger, danger, danger of profiles. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just saying. Those okay. are called trapped emotions, Todd. Um, we can talk about that also. That's a, that's a, there's a great, great book uh, by doc, uh, Dr. Bradley wrote that book on the emotion code. Anyway, sorry. Didn't mean to derail yeah. you, but no, that's where a lot of that comes from. No, I I've, I've done a lot of uh, releasing of trapped emotions uh, and done it yeah. on my family as well. Yeah. Well, it, and, and that's important. So, so those, so you got the filing cabinet, right? And the filing cabinet is is on the experiences you've had. The problem is those experiences might not be the way the world operates. So, right. you know, I'm going to borrow a little from Og Magdino, who wrote the book "The World's Greatest Salesman," and I'm going to add a little bit to you know what, what he would say all the time is that what all of us are is a composite of. Wait for it nature, you know, how you were, yeah. what did your genes you were given, right? Right. I can't play in the NBA. By the way, I shouldn't have expectations as a, you know, I'm built like a fire hydrant. I I have zero vertical, but I shouldn't go to the NBA and demand that I play in the NBA and sue them because they don't have that skill. I don't do that, right? But still, nature, this is what I got. This is what I got to work with. Nurture, how was I raised? What did I experience, right? Books you read busts out of that paradigm. I can, you and I could name, you know, top 10 books that were like mind blowing that made right. you go, there's a whole different way to look at this. And maybe, you know, the home I was raised in didn't offer enough opportunity. No home will ever offer enough opportunity to expand my mind, right? So it's nature, it's nurture, it's the books you read, it's the people you meet. Right? right. I mean, I think last year we did 393 Zooms. We normally do live training, but people always ask me, you know, through our negotiation program, our leadership program, you know, we have over, you know, 20 different programs. People are like, doesn't that ever get boring? I said, are you kidding me? Every time I do the program, there's 24 new chip box in the room and 24 right. people that have their story and 24 people that are going to see things a little bit differently. And when I teach right. a program, I learn something new all the time because I'm yeah. giving a science and then somebody offers their perception from their experiences. And next thing you know, we got a whole new world in front of us. So let's review. Yeah, And you're like, Ooh, good point. Right. And then it, it alters, it improves upon or expands what you're already 
what you've already established. Yeah. Correct. So nature, nurture, the books we read, the people we meet, right? The experiences we have. And this is something that I can tell you, right? The Europeans have us down. They, they, they slay us on this point. They would rather have a smaller home and travel more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and they want to collect those experiences. And when you have experiences, you know, those are creating great memories. They're creating molecules of, of uh, better emotions, a different radio frequency, um, and then I throw in there to people, you know, the other one is um, the, the significant relationship you have in your life. I've been married 30 years. If you think right. that my relationship hasn't shaped, you know, who I am and how I see the world. So let's pause for a moment. I just gave you the, the list of experience, the list of things that shape us. And we carry those as little red wagons. Those right. are little red, it's like I'll just call it a little red wagon. We go into every communication with a little red wagon. Imagine if we didn't go in with preconceived motions. Imagine if we didn't. Right. If we didn't go in with preconceptions, then we'd mm -hmm. just be curious. Right. We'd just be curious about things and we'd learn a lot more. But a lot of times we get in the way of ourselves. So when you say to me, Todd, I've gotten to be a little bit more of a monk, really, I would take that to also mean you're more curious. You're sitting back, you're listening more, you're taking oh, yeah. in more data. And you're, and you're not letting your preconceived, well, you know, notions. Something interesting about that, Todd. What is the, and I, please forgive me, I should know this by now because I've taken so many doggone, the DISC program. You, you've yeah. done those before in your classes, right? The DISC where it measures the four different things, right? So yeah. remember I told you I was more of a warrior, right? So I can remember taking those earlier on in my career. And let's just yeah. call, you know, there's, the, there's four colors. There's red, green, blue, whatever. We teach the red that stuff. is the, that hard driving, you know, salesperson, you know, Correct. get it done. So when they would give you your disc assessment, mine was like, like this. I was way red. Yeah. And then I had kind of the other ones in between. Well, literally just, we were doing some corporate training and they put me through a disc assessment, uh, you know, with, with a group of the um, different parts of the company. And the, the woman who was running it, blown away. Dude, all of mine, dead even across. Yeah. Dead even. She was like, yeah. wow, you're yeah. like, you're like you're, you've got a Zen thing going on. There's no yeah. blip going on. Yeah. Now, that's not anything else. I'm still in sales. It, it's nothing yeah. has changed in me other than the fact, yeah. to your point, I've continued to keep opening up, admitting my own faults, you know, realizing where I'm taking criticism, not bringing ego into it. I do it with my wife. Yeah. You know, my wife can say yeah. something to me now and I just go, I'm sorry. You know, yeah. I, I, I did an yeah. episode. There's an episode coming up that, I, that I'm doing, going to do on the ancient Hawaiian practice of forgiveness called Ho'oponopono, which is, yeah. I don't know, whether, have you, are you familiar with that at all? What I'm that not. is? So it's an ancient practice um, that's been going on a very long time. It goes all the way back to the Maori uh, Tahiti, Polynesian Islands, Hawaii, etc. Basically, what it comes down to is any kind of conflict, argument, anything going on, whether it was inner family, inner tribal, or inner island, they'd bring everybody together. You would voice what your issues and problems are with each other. Yeah. When it's all done, the rule was once that's all been expressed and everybody's accepted it, you have to cut it loose. You cannot hold on to it. Right, which ties into your behaving like a monkey, right? Which was in when the warrior sales book. I want to talk. I'm gonna you're, yeah. I'm gonna get a nice segue here. That that you got to cut that loose, and then you simply yeah. say this: "I'm sorry, forgive me, thank yeah. you, I love you." Yeah. And done. We've adopted yeah. it here in my family, dude. What a shortcut for everything. Yeah. I could do the most stupid thing that I've done a hundred thousand times. I mean, I've been married over 20 years now yeah. that my wife is just like, are you freaking kidding me? How did you just do that again? And I literally just go, I'm sorry, forgive yeah. me. And it's yeah. become an accepted thing. We just go, okay. And we move yeah. on and we let it go. We don't keep bringing up yeah. like, you know, well, why do you keep doing that? I, I still don't understand why you keep doing it. It's all gone. Uh, and yeah. you have that in your book. And this again, so here's that thing again, right? <clears throat> You're talking about it from a sales perspective, how to come in, close a deal, you know, move the number, move the needle forward, do all that. But yeah. yet it so applies that behaving like a monkey, which you give that analogy. You want to talk about that a little bit? The, the coconut, the hole in the coconut. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? So, 
Yeah, so um, it's it's just talking about human nature and, you know, our there's really <clears throat> fascinating research that says 90% of us are just sleepwalking. Fascinating research. And it, I, I want to, before I talk about the monkey, I want to come back a little bit and say um, to your comment earlier, you know, today we live in a world where science is caught up to things people used to call were new age and now we're calling them new normal. I right. Mean, we're we're exactly. teaching a program on It's no human longer performance. woo anymore. That's right. Right. Yeah. We do a program on human performance about positivity shifts, the 36 things you can do in a moment to change the chemicals of your brain. I mean, and it's, it's, and here you are on. questioning why you're on this podcast. Here we go. Go ahead. Well, Just well, go. well. I, I mean, I did. Some of the I mean, things you're know, saying, dude. Honest. You're you're yeah. right in line. So keep going. So the whole concept of the monkey was uh, what native hunters do is they take a coconut and they they carve out a coconut the size the average size of a monkey's hand, and they right. put rice and fruit in there. And um, what the native hunters do is when the monkey is hungry enough, it goes into the coconut, and when it opens up its hand, its hand gets splayed open so far that it can't, when it fills up its hand with food, it cannot release its hand from the coconut. And a native hunter, this is not a Disney story, but well, wait a minute, Disney starts with uh, Father's Death and Simba and Bambi, and anyway, Correct. back on track. This is a Disney still story. Tracks. It still tracks. <laughs> the, you know, pay attention. Disney's playing with uh, your dude, emotions. We talk about that all the time in this house. Talk about right it all the, the time. Box. It goes reptilian <laughs> on you all the time. Uh, Beauty and the Beast. The Daughter's Lost. I mean, these are horrible stories, right? But anyway, they always I end know. so nicely. Anyway, this doesn't end nicely for the monkey, by the way. Because what ends up happening is the monkey's hand is in there. And it won't release the behavior of holding onto the food because it's so hungry. And it tries to get its hand out of the coconut. It can't get its hand out of the coconut. The coconut's attached to something and the native hunter just can walk right up to the monkey. And here's the monkey trying to get its hand out and the native hunter gets the monkey. What's the point? The native, the, the monkey will not, even though that behavior is going to hurt them, that monkey will not change that behavior. And I got one other monkey story for you that's gonna blow your mind away. About five years ago, you wanna talk about radio frequency? They had monkeys that were separated on islands, and monkeys don't swim. It was right. somewhere, I don't know, in the Philippines or something. I'll have to go back and look at it again. Phenomenal research. They found that, you know, monkeys don't take a banana that gets sandy and walk to the ocean and, you know, clean it off. Monkeys were right. not doing that, okay? There was one research group on one island that I want to say was like 10 miles away, and monkeys don't swim. Another research group was on another island, and all of a sudden the research group watched a monkey that had a bunch of sand on something, and the monkey walks to the ocean. I'm walking like a monkey for you, Chip. He's walking to the ocean, right? And he washes the food in the ocean. And it's the first time that I've ever seen a monkey take something right. that had dirt on it. Mostly monkeys are just you know going like this or eating it the way it right. is. A day later, 10 miles away, another monkey on that island did that same behavior. That's the and spooky so at a distance that, that Einstein was talking about. It was spooky yeah. at a distance. You know, that's, I've, I have no problem through all the work that Edgar Casey did and all that work about, oh, yeah. there is a radio, there is a human consciousness, right? And, you know, when you think about the strife that's in the world and the whole bit, my commentary about this entire experience we're having is when the pendulum, sometimes the pendulum has to swing so far in pain that it'll swing back. It always has, it always will, right? right. Hope is the strongest human emotion. You know, we hope for finances, we hope for love, we hope for this, um, but we have enough history to prove that we don't have to have hope on this strife we're having right now, that we always come out of things, you know, right. better than we were before. But right. come back to the monkey story that we as human beings hang on to behaviors. Countries hang on to behaviors that are outdated. You said it 20 minutes ago. Oh, and yeah. so, you know, we need to really sit back, again, those six things that shape us. So by the way, the seventh is your spiritual journey. That can break you, but that's into the books that people read and people you meet. But, you know, you could double down on that one and say, you know, have you, have you considered, you know, some element of spirituality? And the research on that is so powerful and how it impacts, you know, human performance. Now, spirituality has a wide definition, wide definition. Correct. But anyway. Correct. There you go. And it, well, to your point. There's the monkey right? story, Chip. And look, when you're, as you're talking, and again, I try and... 
I try and ride this this wire, right, of political and religion, and I'm trying to, because I, I don't want, that's not what the show's about, right? It's what we're trying to do is to always find that common thread, right, that, that to show that, hey, this is just one big, big, big planet, one human race, we need to start working together. And so, like, immediately, like, I read your, like, I'm rereading your book last night, I'm reading The Monkey story, immediately what comes to my head is The Hope and a Pono, right? From the yeah. uh, from the Hawaiians, right? About just letting go and yeah. and, and that whole the, the ancient process of forgiveness. And I'm thinking to myself, it, is that is Putin the monkey with his hand in the coconut right now? Because that's pretty much what's going on. And I'm not even talking political, having to do with you know what his fears were, or Ukraine's fears were, or anything like that. Just simply, he started this path. And you look at the pictures and you see what's happening. And I said to somebody the other day, I'm like, even if Russia wins and takes back Ukraine, the economic damage to that country, what have you now taken control of? It's a wasteland, right? So your hand's stuck in the coconut. You've, he's lost sight of the fact that this maybe wasn't such a great idea, but because he doesn't yeah. want to let go of that food, it's just yeah. going to keep going, right? And it doesn't... This is that same behavior, and Todd, I know you're a huge fan of history, um, you know, meaning you know global conflict and things like that. How many times does this have to keep happening before we finally go? And that's the one thing I do finally see occurring is that I'm seeing countries that normally would have not reacted to this really, kind of stayed on the periphery. Man, they're finally going, this doesn't make any sense. We may have a different border. We may have economic issues. We may have things we're not happy with, but gosh darn it, we just got to remember we're human beings here. What are we, what are we doing? This isn't 1933 anymore. That that well, didn't we mean, learn our lesson back then? We shouldn't be just destroying things no. for the sake of ego and 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 again, a hand caught in a coconut. No, Go ahead, we, we, well, we, we haven't learned, and you know, I'm a huge fan of uh, Dan Carlin, um, hardcore history, and he goes back and talks about. You know, have we evolved after everything we've learned from World War II? Um, and they did interesting, you know, he, he quotes this interesting research where they put a teacher in a, in a small cubicle where they couldn't see anybody through the wall. And then they put a person on, across the wall. And that person was, you know, a student that was faking um, uh, what I'm about to share with you. And they had the teacher and they said to the teacher, uh, we're going to ask nine questions. When they get an answer wrong... Uh, you're going to pick up the phone. You're going to answer the question. When they get something wrong, you're going to give them an electrical shock. Right. Okay. This research right. was done 15 years ago. Sure. And they said if they get, for every one they get wrong, you increase the frequency. And then the person would fake being in pain. So they did level one. And the person would go, oh, the level two. They were blown away by how many teachers took it to level, I mean, like electrocuting the person. That's how right. the teacher thought right. they were doing. So no, the answer to you is we, we haven't really learned a lot. And then, it, you know, Putin is, through this whole conflict, my favorite people to listen to is the people that are actually in the game. Um, my favorite ones are the CIA analysts that they parade out, okay? Yeah. And I've our generals those. that have been yeah. there and done it. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I listen to Pendergast very carefully. And, you know, you listen to these guys that have studied Putin. And the biggest thing we need to understand is, just like I teach in sales, you want to understand your customer a little bit better. You want to have higher empathy. Yeah. What did they buy in the past and why did they buy it? Past behaviors predict the future. And what these guys have said is the reason we're seeing this behavior from Putin, the reason he's the monkey that can't let go is because how he came to power. He came Correct. to power through the um, Secret Service, yeah. you know, the FSB the and the KGB. Yeah. And oh, yeah. so this, this other uh, CIA guy said, people think that people are going to overthrow him. No. People think the military is going to overthrow him. No, it's going to be the FSB that overthrows yeah. Putin. And so yeah. his behavior of killing women and children, right, is putting us all like, but that's what they learn throughout history is to subjugate people. The only way to do it is to hurt people. And Which so it creates fear. It creates fear. But right. now the human spirit across the world is going, this is horrible. We're done with it. So watch the pendulum. Right? This is horrible. We're done with it. People are in pain. We've never seen clips like what we're seeing with innocent civilians. I'm, 
Come right. on. We never have. And as we all watch it. Well, only it, old, it, only old war footage, right? But Stuff I heard that, that we, in we it. think of it in the past, right? That would never Correct. happen again. It's all retroactive. And now we're seeing it happening right now. Again, they're calling it the TikTok war because everything yeah. is happening like in real time. And people are like, oh my God, this is what war is. I said to them the other day, I'm like, you know, uh, th this is what, what, our, what, what it's teaching the young kids or the younger generation that's playing games like Call of Duty and stuff is that, hey, there's no respawn here. This is yeah, not, right. you know, and, and Todd, I think you and I've shared this before, too. My dad was a was a World War Two veteran, veteran, first wave into Omaha Beach um, yeah. and, and I, at 18 years old. And I can remember wow. when I was a kid, I was fascinated with you know, Bowie knives and, and uh, bayonets and things like that. I thought they were really cool. And my dad had some of them, et cetera. But I remember being a kid and him talking to me. I was probably like 12 or 13 years old. And it was out of nowhere. And he just said, I don't think you understand what it's like to take a human life with a knife. It is the most yeah. brutal, awful, horrible thing that you could ever do yeah. to somebody else or have done to you. And what's weird about yeah. that, Todd, I showed him Saving Private Ryan. My dad passed away in, in 2015. Um, yeah. But prior to that, I, I brought him down. He was down at the house, and I, he hadn't seen Private Ryan yet. And we sat down and watched Saving Private Ryan. First of all, he was blown away by the fact that it was the first film he's ever seen that took him back to that morning. But there's a scene in that. I don't know if you remember. I can't remember the actor. Yes. The last name of the actor's name is Goldberg. And, and the German... Uh, yep. A, a soldier kills him very slowly with that. It's, yeah. it's, it's not, it, what's weird is it's not graphic blood wise. It's no. graphic energetically emotionally. and emotionally. Right. Yeah. And it was Draining. the first time for me, I was like, Oh my, that's what my dad's talking about. That's horrific. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I think is happening is people are realizing, wow, this is, we, this is yeah. not good. You know, to see even, you know, it, it, you know, we pulled out of Afghanistan and we've done all these things, but I think even for this country, it was yeah. all happening at a distance. And yeah. now to see it, I don't know, there's something's different. And I don't want to say it has anything to do with the countries or the type of people, because now then we start going down another road. I don't think that's really what it is. I think it has more to do with, I think the vibration of the planet has changed from the time from 9 11, right? Yeah. And when we went in there to now, I just think the whole planet is in a different place and we're reacting differently what do you what do you think about that yeah i think i well first of all i hope so i hope the vibration but i'm not right. uh, naive um in this vibration to your point is going to cause strife uh i think putin is the monkey that can't let go of certain behaviors um and when i was in moscow i had moscovites share some startling insights for me they said, you know, there really is no mother Russia. They go, we're a bunch of tribes and 90% of the population is not living in cities. They're out in the country. Right. And the reason that Putin goes Jaguar hunting with a shirt off, riding on a horse that we've all seen. Right. Is yeah. Because the message being sent to the country people is I'm defending you. Right. But they were very clear. There is no mother Russia. We're a series of tribes, right? But the world... Yeah. It's like the emperor with no clothes that the world, you know, right. automatically gives Putin that kind of power. But Putin has created that kind of power for the people in that country. And so, right. you know, when we when we think about strife, Putin's playing off of the model that his people are stupid. And I'm sorry, in the United States, we have politicians. <laughs> we don't do that, that here, Todd. That. We don't have politicians to do that. <laughs> well, well. It, you know, it's their job and they're playing to a reptilian. I think, I, think I heard a recording one time where they literally referred to us all as sheep. There was some there that wasn't yes. too long ago. There was literally a recording. Yeah. I want and again, I'm not even talking about a president. I'm talking about somebody yeah. else in another level of power in our government literally right. referred to us as, you know, the, the sheep or the lambs uh that, yeah. that basically are wandering around. Um so yeah, yeah it's, it's some, the similarities are please, and the similarity you know, I hope of people, that, I hope right? Nobody, understand you know doesn't doesn't see the similarities yeah yeah it's well that's a great point is nobody sees it you know we think oh they're in that country they act that way and they're a bunch of sheep and the truth right. of the matter is they're looking at us thinking we're a bunch of sheep and you know my litmus <laughs> test i was a political science minor i'm an independent i am my yeah. test my litmus test if if i'm speaking to a sheep 
is if if they attack the personality, if they Correct. go, oh, Trump's an you know an idiot, he's a narcissist, uh, right. Biden is you know incoherent, you know whatever. And I'm like, okay, let's talk policies. Right. I mean, I, we, we've gotten, you know, it used to be we'd talk about common sense, but now I've gotten to the point, well, let's talk uncommon sense because we've gotten so derailed. You know, the strife of the world right now is that what we think is common sense is what the sheep has said is common sense. And so we have right. to think about uncommon sense in order right. to get, you know, right. to the truth of, you know, having a little bit more objective discernment uh, related to what is happening in the world. So anyway, back to your comment about, um, strife is, yeah, I think we're going to, it's, it's natural that we're going to continue to go through strife. I think the vibration, uh, for change is humans don't like change. Leaders don't like change. It's uncomfortable. We don't know what's on the other side. So Correct. it's going to take, you know, people tuning into a different radio frequency and actually starting, let's go back to the blue planet, right? The, the, it's, let's go from the blue planet to the gray matter. You've got to start with yeah. the things that you know, um, are, are make you happy? Have you investigated architecting, aim, and actualizing? You know, do you know your value systems? You know, are you being productive? Right. Productive? Do you know your talents? You know, if you right. if you lay on your head on your pillow every day, knowing that you've used your talents and gifts, right? Like like you, Chip. This is a passion that you have to do these podcasts. Yeah. You lay your head on the pillow yeah. at night. You're energized for doing it, right? Have you oh, laid yeah. your head on the pillow, being productive and applying? a talent or a gift that you were given to do, right? And if you were to do that and you were to focus on yourself first, right. then a lot of the strife would go away. A lot right. of the strife would go away. But because we, we, we start to think that our neighbor's an enemy, right? We don't have time to think about ourselves because a reptilian brain goes, danger, danger. I don't know my enemy. I don't know my neighbor, so they're my enemy. So yeah, you want right. to talk about strife and vibration? I, the biggest way to get through this strife and vibration is everybody take a moment, drop, drop and roll and focus on your own gray matter on your own life, which is right. short, you know, create a, create a plan for what do you want out of your life? You know, right. investigate. This is all research, by the way, if you apply your values and your strengths and you create positivity, 36 positivity shifts, and then you architect, architect, aim and actualize that. You know, and then you move forward with setting expectations. The greatest, the greatest issue today, this is going to rock your world. I believe the greatest issue today is our expectations are out of whack. We tell kids, oh, go do that and go do this. No, I, I can't play in the NBA. So give me expectations. Right. Expectations today are merely planning for a disappointment. Instead, sit down and talk about what's attainable, what's real, and then no, build we, your plan with your strengths. Look, we just, I just went through this with, with our daughter. My daughter's a senior in high school. Um, you know, you and I come from the background of, you know, do well on tests, get into a good school, get into a good company, you know, that very heavy duty programming, right. That, 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 you know, you, you have to, you have to work hard. This isn't, this is something else too. Cause I noticed this in your book, there were certain, th certain areas where you talk about, you know, working hard, that that's, you know, part of the formula, so to speak. Um, I've noticed that shifting. And what I mean by that is it doesn't mean don't do the work. Not what I mean. There is a philosophy or a program that's been going on for a long time that, you know, as an example, you have to have a four year, you know, bachelor's degree before you're allowed to do blank. Right. Or if you're an act, you got to pay your dues, all that kind of stuff. Who said, what, where did this structure come from that things have to be hard? If you follow your heart and follow your passion, more than likely, it's going to feel like a whole lot of fun. You're still going to be doing the work. The vibration is going to be really high. And guess what will happen? You'll get to all the success you were looking for, and you'll go, wow, it doesn't feel like I worked at all for that. didn't feel like it was hard work at all. And what I've been noticing is it feels like the whole concept of work hard, pay your dues, da, 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 is not to help push you forward, but to hold you down. And that was a big epiphany for me where I was like, you know, I, I played college football, I, you know, very, very much in that, you know, beat the other guy, high competition, you know, high energy, work hard, pay your dues, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, when it came to my daughter, looking at this whole thing as she now is looking forward to what she wants to do, I turned more into a coach than, 
you know, where my dad was probably more of a parent per se, I'm using air quotes. I've turned more into what I, I tell them. I, we tell our daughter that all the time. I'm like, look, my job isn't to be a parent. Yes. There's times when I need to be a parent, right? You know, um, don't put your, you know, little kid, don't, don't put your hand on the hot stove. That's a parent. There's no coaching involved. <laughs> don't do that. You're going to burn yourself. Um, but when you start getting into this age group, it's not a matter of, Hey, do as you're told. It's, Th this is why, you know, you, you might want to try it this way. Well, I tried it that way, dad, but I, I, you know, I kind of found it easier to do this. Okay. Did you get the same result? Yeah, I did. Great. Right. And I, and I run my teams the same way. Uh, you Todd, you and I've talked about this before. I don't care about if, if there's an A, B, C, D to get from point A to point D, I don't really care what happens in the middle letters. If you, if you can figure, I, I've told team members of mine, if you can spend two hours a week working and the rest of the time hanging out on the beach, sun tanning, I'm not going to come and beat you up and, and still get the same results, by the way, as the other person that's, you know, living out of a suitcase. I'm not going to come and beat you up about it. I'm going to have you come and teach me how I can work two hours and spend the right. rest of my week on the beach and get the same results. Um, and so, you know, what's funny is your book actually takes people through how to do that, which is one of the things I, I really love about it because there's so much in it having to do with taking time for yourself, understand the people around you, lead with love, not with ego, understanding, listening, you know, which I think for a lot of type A salespeople, they're like, screw that. I need to take out my competitor and knock down the wall. Um, I don't think you have to work that hard. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think um, it's one of the most powerful epiphanies I had is I watched talk about being a parent, being a coach. Do we have to work that hard? Let me tackle each one separately. You know, as a, as a parent, I watched my children go through sports and we let them experiment. And if they didn't have a passion, we, we didn't do the organized sport thing. It just, it's, it right, separates right. families and we were not, we were, sure. we had to be really careful with that. If any one of our kids, had especially had, they're not enjoying it. Yeah. That's the point. That was the point I'm making yeah. is, is, you know, yeah. we, we let them experience, experiment and experience. And if they found a passion, we would have completely supported it and right. been in a different city every day. So don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But one sure. of the things I noticed is uh, what's gotten really bad in the world today. And my daughter was a great lacrosse player um, is that, you know, the, the you, you, you constantly competing against, even the people on your own team and knocking each other down and that sort of thing. Um, and the strife that that would cause, and it was mostly coming from the parents, you know, in, in the strife that the parents had and how they would uh, make, you know, remarks that are not healthy for um, a parent to be making about even other children, their children. And so, the message I started carrying forward as much as best as I could was listen, first everybody just focus on yourself. Right? Don't don't yeah. Don't tell me three things you're working on before you tell me one thing about one of the other players. <laughs> right. And so dude, right you know, there, that 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 little mantra that you just threw out, you can carry that everywhere. 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 Parent, every aspect of your life. Neighbor, husband, wife, brother, doesn't matter. You, you can use that everywhere, including business. So on the parent thing, you know, one thing I, I'm really going to focus in on for you is there are times, and I know you know this, Chip, there's times we have to be a parent. I like asking questions, Socratic method of parenting. You know, when it, as my children were, you know, getting raised, they were like, well, um, you know, I was going to do this or do that. And I'm like, well, what do you think? You know, get them to think, engage their brain. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But also, um, the other comment I'd make on that is, you know, these parents that let their children go off to these uh, universities where they pay eighty thousand dollars a year, knowing their child's yeah. going to be a teacher, and they took out loans. So eighty thousand yeah, yeah. times four, you know, that's a parent's fault. Who sends right. a child out to put them into debt, right? Yeah, I they got think... caught up in the in the my child got into NYU. Well, what do they want to do? Well, they want yeah, to be a what, teacher. What'd you well, pay? Why are you paying for NYU for them to be a teacher? Right. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that's yeah. when a parent, that's when an adult needs to step in the room. 
and go, right. wait, start over again. I had a conversation with a 23 year old who was one year out in work. And all of a sudden he said to me, you know, Mr. Todd, he said, you know, I just feel like my soul, I'm a burnt out empty shell of a person now that I'm working in the whole bit. I just want to quit yeah. everything, live in a car and, and write a book. I said, have you ever written a book before? Did you ever take a class in writing a book? He looked at me and he goes, no, but that's what I'm going to do. I said, okay. I go, I just don't think that's, I'm going to be perfectly frank. I'm not going to coach you through this. No, <laughs> right. that's ridiculous, right? right? And then, and he goes, well, okay, but maybe, you know, I'll write a movie script. I go, have you ever taken a class on a movie script? No. Have you ever written a movie script? No. Then why do you want to, I like movies. I said, okay, no, that's ridiculous. Right. Now you can write a book at night. You can write a movie script at night. Sure. Why wouldn't you do that? But, right. but all of a sudden saying, you know, you're going to follow your passion, which you think is your passion. Right. But not setting a structure for it. I said, I right. took me 18 months to write my book at night on the weekends because I had a full-time job. Right. Do you think I just right. stopped everything exactly. and exactly. said, I'm going to stop everything? No. So, you know, that's a parent. They do have to step in. Now, a coach Correct. helps them a massage because humans need to feel empowered. Right? Correct. And that's the dialogue I heard you having with your daughter is helping her yeah, feel yeah. a little bit more, you know, empowered with it. Right. Uh, Chip, I have to plug in... Believe it or not, I had a full battery. I have to plug in my laptop from this great conversation. I don't know okay. how much longer I've got with you. What were you plan? How much more time were we planning on together, brother? I, look, I, I was willing to go as long as you want to go. Uh, I, I don't try and really cut it off. Um, but I mean, we can start to wrap it up here if you want to. That's fine with me. Uh, Todd, honestly, there's so much more I wanted to talk to you about. I'm going to have you back again. That's just that's how we'll do it. Uh, well, that you, would be you're, you're definitely you'd definitely be another episode for sure. Probably another two or more episodes, honestly, with everything that we've we've we, we've been talking about. Um, what I'll do is this, Todd. So you know, we're 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 gonna we're gonna do another episode on this. Uh, again, for everybody out there listening and watching, uh, uh, I hope we didn't get too far off base. Uh, believe it or not, it all ties in. To this, I don't, I don't, you know, Todd's laughing at me right now because he's like, wow, look at him. He's selling my book. No, I'm really not. I, it's not, I don't, I don't sell and there's no money stuff books. like this. No, no, I don't sell this. This yeah. is simply things, there, there are certain tools, certain things that I believe truly in my heart that are impactful, um, that can open up your mind and make you go, wow, that's, uh, I didn't think about it that way. Or wow, that's think of this like you know it, i know it's a it's it's a sales book and it, you know for corporate america but in all honesty it, it's kind of like a cookbook for how to be a better human I, i'll be honest with you I, I, in business in relationships towards other people everything in here applies and yes some of it is going to take you into the you know is that how i think is, have i been thinking that way uh, have i been approaching my customers that way or my boss or my wife or my daughter or what family members, what have you. Um, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I, I definitely worth the read. Todd, like I said, we're going to have you back uh, to do more of this because uh, there's so much more to talk to you about. I do like to end each episode, ask you three words. You can answer with a simple, you know, one word answer or a sentence, whatever you like. But when you hear the word peace, what comes to mind? Uh, heart, you know, that, that you, there's a, there's a peace, there's a, there's a serene peace in your heart. And that's my answer. So that, so that good, no matter what's going on around you, you, you've got that serenity in your heart. So the other word is love. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I, I think of unconditional love i think of the word unconditional and the feeling the 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 joyful feeling of being unconditionally loved and then i think about the journey you take to understand the dimensions of love right i think about my 30 year relationship with my life, my wife you know where we were where we started is not where we're at right now you know we probably went through um Early on in our marriage, it was, you know, probably lust, and then it was have kids and it's survival, then you go into truce, and then when you come out of that, it's 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 so it's so overwhelming where you can be, it can take you to your knees. So when I think about 
love. Nice. I think there's unconditional love, but then there's also love that you've done together, a collaborative love. Beautiful. So, okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, and the last word is aloha. Ah, uh, you know, you know, it's funny. Um, I guess the first thing I think about is, is goodbye. So, but really, I don't know why I thought that way because aloha means welcome, right? It, it can actually mean both. It actually right, can mean right. both. Aloha. The Hawaiians yeah. have a whole thing about it that it's about this connected energy, right? That, that what they do is a mirror back towards themselves. Yeah. It's a loop, yeah. right? So it's that common thread. You treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's really, they, they truly believe in that energetic, the Polynesians believe in that energetic connection that connects everything, not just human sure. beings, but every living thing on the planet, which in turn yeah. ties into the field and the frequency and the whole nine yards. So that's, that's beautiful. I will throw one little thing in there. The, there was a quote that you had, and again, we're going to dig more into this in the next episode when we have you back. But you, there was a section you had called Love Thy Competitor. So I'm kind of circling yep. back a little bit more to this corporate sales thing. But the quote you used was from uh, Ellie Weisel, which was the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. Yeah. And that, I feel, is so vital to what's going on in the planet right now, mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. if, you're, if you have indifference to what's happening, either in your little local environment or globally, Man, mm -hmm. take a moment, look inside yourself. Mm -hmm. Look, you can be upset with somebody. I'm not saying don't, but it's the indifference. I think that's what needs to go away. So, Todd, thank you so much. Uh, for all of you watching, as always, find peace, lead with love, and live. Aloha. This has been Blue Rock. Thanks again, Todd. We'll catch up soon. Thank you. You're very Mahalo. kind and I'm very grateful for you.